Yes, yes. You can't hear me? Yes. Am, am I amplified a little bit? Yes. Okay. Good, good, good. Uh, I give uh, all credit to Jenny for coming up with this ingenious idea. Thomas. It's uh, Thomas. Thomas, okay. Okay. Well, Thomas and Jenny, whoever. Uh, I thought we've never done this before, I don't think. And what a wonderful opportunity to hear back from those who we've had a hand in shaping and forming for leadership in the church. You know, this isn't new for us. We've been doing it for 200 years. Uh, it's part of our identity, our DNA as a parish. Uh, just uh, out of curiosity, how many of you have ever served or are currently serving on the lay committee? Yeah. Yeah, so most all of you. Now, who, who is not? Then we're going to take your name. <laughs> So with the seminary being founded here, I, I thought I would use again this lovely seminary prayer. I don't think it gets used enough, but um, remember that um, right here at St. Paul's, the idea of training and shaping leaders for the future of the church was so critically important it became part of our mission. So the Lord be with you. And also and with you. you. Let us pray. O oh God, you have committed to your servants the ministry of reconciliation, and you've guided our forebears to found the Virginia Theological Seminary. Watch over all of us, we pray you, in the years to come, as you have guided us in the past. Keep our leaders alert to the voice of your spirit, that we cling only to such things as are good in the past and press forward with courage to the new service of the future. Grant us humbly to learn, wisdom to plan, courage to follow where your truth may lead, and love to think of others before self. Bind us all into a holy fellowship. Make all our worship work and play witness faithfully to you, so that the seminary and St. Paul's may be a center from which light and life and love radiate to the four corners of the earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, our format is simple today. We're going to ask each of our seminarians to give us just a brief bio, sort of name, serial number, uh, rank, um, and anything they want to tell us about how they got to, to this place, uh, how they're sitting here today. And then Jenny and I are going to have a couple of questions that we ask them and ask them to respond to, and then the floor is open to you. So be thinking now about uh, anything you've ever wanted to know about what it's like to be a seminarian at St. Paul's. And uh, hopefully they'll be honest and, and tell you <laughs> what it's like. Um, uh, so, uh, Liza, why don't you go first and sit right there. Okay. Is this on? It is. Oh, it is on. Okay. Hi, I'm Eliza Brinkley. Um, I am from Raleigh, North Carolina, um, born and raised. Um, and I grew up at a church very similar to St. Paul's um, big, you know, at, at least a thousand members, if not bigger, um, Episcopal Church, Christ Church Raleigh, um, which is downtown, um, and was formed there, and uh, my parents were married there, and me and all my siblings were baptized and confirmed there, so we had the whole shebang, like I'm sure a lot of y'all and, and your children and um, grandchildren uh, have experienced, and um, yeah, sort of, what else, what else am I supposed to say? Just where, how I got here. <laughs> and um, where are you in the process? Oh, in point? the process. So I'm currently um, what's called a candidate, um, which basically means it's the step right before you are ordained to the diaconate. So I'm kind of right on the step below Thomas. 
um, at that point. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jackson Davey. I am from Kalispell, Montana, so right outside of Glacier Park. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Yes, there are, there are, there are, we're here. We're everywhere. Um, <laughs> we get out. Um, I uh, came to St. Paul's and came to Virginia when I met my wife and I was moving here for law school. Um, but then through the wilds of 2020, COVID, pandemic, all of that, uh, moved up here to attend Virginia Seminary and are now in the um, process. So I'm a few steps below Eliza. I have my interview for postulancy uh, next week, actually. So, you know, send in your letters now. Uh, <laughs> and if everything goes well, then I will be going through the rest of the ordination process to join my other like-minded seminarians here. Jackson, can I yes. add to that? So sure. something that happened in this journey is that um, along the way, St. Paul's became Jackson's sponsoring parish within the Diocese of Virginia. So do say extra prayers for him on Wednesday. He's coming um, sent by this community. I'm Thomas Alexander. I am from Little Rock, Arkansas born and raised there. Um, I am a deacon. Uh, so in the um, ordination <laughs> process, thank you. <laughs> in the ordination process, it's, it's something like uh, postulant, where Jackson is applying for right now, right? And then candidate, and then ordinand for deacon, and then you apply for ordination for priesthood, and then you're ordained a priest. So I'm right now an um, applicant for ordination for priesthood in Arkansas. Um, I came to St. Paul's through Lillian. Uh, my wife Lillian works here doing children, youth, and family ministry. Um, I'm sure I would have visited St. Paul's, um, but I don't know if I would have found St. Paul's had it not been through Lillian. And I'm sure we all have stories like that of how we might have come across a community because of someone else. Um, and that, that's what it was for me. What were the other questions? Oh, I think that's good. That was good yes. Um, and this just reminds me of hearing these stories just now is sort of part of our life is saying hello and then saying goodbye. And it seems that there, it's, it happens very fast for us. And uh, one of the things, I feel like old Mother Hubbard uh, with uh, all the children, uh, that they're all over the church. They populated every corner of the U.S. and some around the world. And it's wonderful that uh, we have, have done such a good job and um raising folks up and then uh, saying goodbye, letting them go. Uh, and then as we prepare to say goodbye to Thomas and Lillian, uh, it's just always a poignant moment. So I remind me of all the grace in that. We're thankful for the time and sad. Uh, go and happy for your new ministry. Um, okay, that's all the easy stuff. I'm going to cut right to the chase. The narrative in the world is that religion is declining in general, the Episcopal Church in specific, uh, the outlooks are bleak, uh, people are writing the obituary for the Episcopal <coughs> Church, you're re ready to launch ministry. Uh, how does that sound to you? What are your signs of hope? What gives you encouragement? And what are your thoughts about the shape of the future of the Church? Anyone want to jump in first? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Got the Senior seminarian goes first. <laughs> um, being in seminary is just a really hopeful experience in a lot of ways. Um, one, I think, because you're exposed to the history of the church in such a way that gives you a lot of perspective of where we are in the church right now. Um, we're experiencing a decline based on where we were in the church in the United States, um, you know, in the past century or two. Um, and, and so we really feel that. But at the same time, when you, you look at the whole history of the church, there are lots of ups and downs and painful moments and glorious moments. Um, so I do think it's a, it's a painful moment for the church in lots of ways, but, um, but seminary has given me a lot of, of perspective in that sense. But a lot of hope, too, in that um, my class in particular, uh, the average age is probably early 30s which is kind of astounding um, that people, um, I'm in my 20s, there are lots of people in their 20s also in my class. So when you have people like that, that were um, some raised in the church, some who found the church, at that early of an age, 
and early in their lives willing to commit in this way. Um, I, I don't know. I, I just um, gives me hope to say the least, but I think it's also a, an excellent counter testimony to narratives that the church is dying, right? It's clearly not when you're sitting in a classroom like that uh, and seeing the people that have decided to come, like all three of us, right? Uh, a story that comes to mind for me is actually um, a wonderful um, kind of apocryphal story of St. Anthony, um, where a Roman soldier going around collecting treasures for the emperor says, you know, we need to collect all the, the artwork that you have in this church. And he says, okay, give me like three days time. And after three days, the guards come in and they see all of these homeless folks and lepers and people sitting in the pews. And he says, this is the treasures of the church. And I think that's something that I think about when we hear these stories about decline and we think about loss, that actually, if we took stock of the communities that we serve, the communities that we live in and are called to be with as Christians, I think we might get a little bit leaner and meaner, but I think that we've, we've got treasures all around us if we can open our eyes to it. That's a wonderful thing that I think I've seen, I think anyone can tell you at Virginia Seminary, is that you meet people from all colors and creeds coming together to do this thing that we call church. Um, and I think it will, it will absolutely look different. Things will, I think, morph and change to meet how we are called to live in the world. But I think if we look at it as a treasure rather than seeing it as a thing that we might have to kind of resist, if we hold our faith with an open hand, I think that there can be something really beautiful happening. So I don't have any concrete answers, but I'm, I'm ready to do the next right thing for what I know I can do today to help the church for tomorrow. Yeah, you know, I, I'm 30, um, and I have a lot of friends that just, like, don't get why I'm doing this. They're like, what? Um, you know, a lot of them, maybe they grew up in the church, but there's a lot of people, I think, in our generation who are, you might have heard this term, but the nuns, not N-U-N-S, <laughs> N-O-N-E-S, meaning, like, they don't really identify as, like, even agnostic or atheist, but they're just, like, nothing um, when it comes to faith. Um, and so I, when I think about those people... I think the, the biggest hope we have as the church is to really focus on Jesus Christ. Um, you know, you can get fellowship and friends and, you know, whatever else at your social brunch club on set, you know? I mean, so what is it that makes the church different? Like we have to, we have to focus on that, I think, because otherwise people are going to be like, well, why do I need that? Right. I can, I can go to a yoga class downtown and get the same spiritual fulfillment. But so if we don't, if we don't tell the story of who Jesus is, um, the living Jesus, right. Who's in our world constantly, um, and of the resurrection, then I think we've, we've lost our way. Um, and I think recently I've seen the Episcopal Church just really take up that narrative again. Um, I think Michael Curry's rhetoric is right on point with what we need in this world right now, um, especially with all the divisiveness that we're seeing in our world. And um, yeah, I just think, I don't know, I just really believe that Jesus is the hope to, you know, our what we're dealing with, with, with our struggles and our, where, we, where we're suffering as a society. And I think the more we lean into that message, the better off we're going to be. Um, so one of the things that's um, particular to Virginia Seminary that's not as true of the way some folks are, are doing their journey towards ordination is that it's a residential experience. Three years, you're, you're living there. Now, you don't have to be becoming ordained or living in residence to take advantage of the resource that theological education can be in your life as a disciple, right? So I just want to just want to name that. But you are doing this particular journey. I'm just curious, um, what has surprised you? 
given your expectation of what that might be like? Is there something in particular that stands out that going into seminary I expected this, but now that I'm there I've found it's like that? Yeah, I think for me, so, is this still on? Yeah, and this is louder. Ooh, I feel more powerful. Um, <laughs> I think one of the things that surprised me the most is just the community aspect of it. I, um, I now have this position where I have to like do events for the community, and Friday night we had a variety show which is when like anyone in the community, so it could be a seminary and it could be, you know, some seminarians come with obviously family um, or with children. So anyone in the community could get up and perform an act of some kind. And it's just a, it's a lovely thing to watch um, when a community comes together like that um, and can just have a good time. And I think that part was surprising. I think I knew okay, like, I'm going to go to class, you know, I'll probably make a few friends, but it really is this, like, communal living. And sometimes that's challenging. Like, you know, people get on your nerves. Like, sometimes you're like, I really don't want to sit next to this person at lunch today. Like, if I have to sit next to them, I don't know what I'm going to do. So, like, it's challenging. You know, you have to, and I think that's so important for parish ministry as well, right? Like, we are all a part of the body of Christ, and that includes every single one of us with all of our annoying qualities, right? And so just being conditioned to live in that kind of, you know, environment where you're with all these different people, I think is really good training. So I'll share a uh, wonderfully funny, funny story now. Um, when Emily and I had moved to Virginia Seminary, we had just gotten off of a five-week road trip. We had packed everything that we had in storage and just kind of drove Virginia to Oregon and we're coming back. And we picked up everything in a U-Haul. We're putting it in our new apartment. We had just had a long day of moving everything up. Great, wonderful. We had left to go turn in our U-Haul. Coming back, we walk into our apartment and it's full of smoke. What happened was um, Emily had a box of vintage cameras that she's had from her grandfather who used to take pictures when he was in the Navy that had sat on top of this electric stove and it started to melt onto the stove. And so there's smoke everywhere. So we ran, turned it off, getting everything out of there. And we're just sitting there waiting for the fire truck to show up at like nine o'clock at night. Um, and in that moment, we truly saw how much of a community the seminary could be. Um, because as the firemen are getting up there to check on the smoke, we have our neighbors trying to get us into a lower level empty apartment and they're getting us an air mattress. They're getting snacks over at Trader Joe's for us to eat for the night, making sure that even our dog had a dog bed to sleep on. And then um, going up there at probably midnight and chipping away at this huge kind of plastic goo that had melted over the top of our stove. Um, so we really are, I think, we are a big community. You get to form, I think, in these three years, you get to create lifelong relationships, um, a network not just of students, but also professors, and you get to meet people throughout um, you get to meet people throughout the church. I mean, you do realize just how small the Episcopal Church is and how interconnected we are when we're all at this, at this space. So I'm really thankful for it. Dean Markham gives a um, image in August term, which is the three week long orientation that you have at the beginning of seminary about um, seminary being like a, a rock, you know, amongst other rocks, kind of you know, smoothing out the, the, all the hard surfaces and, and whatnot. Um, and it's painful and difficult, but at the end, you're kind of shiny. And it kind of <laughs> justifies some of the difficulty of, of, of seminary. Um, I'm thinking of that. And I'm also thinking of, um, I think it's a quote attributed to Benedict, uh, this, the saint, the monk that helped to found this Benedictine order of, of monasticism, uh, someone asked him, what's the hardest part about being a monk? He said, other monks. <laughs> 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 Which is true, I think, in seminary, too, in a way. Um, and I think it's really humbling, right, to, to know that 
seminary, um, you have a, pe a bunch of people that want to kind of imagine that a seminary community could be more easygoing, more kind to one another, but we're still just a bunch of, of human beings that <laughs> can annoy one another, and it's, it's difficult, but, it, it, but you pray together in chapel every single day um, for like an hour, right? I mean, it's like a lot of time together, meals together, classes together, living together. Um, so I'm thinking of that, of just the, the humility of, of learning um, patience with people, um, and, and also the, the slow process of learning to love people that you may kind of dismiss someone at first, but um, you end up being incredibly close to them by the end. Um, so that's one thing, but something that surprised me in getting to seminary, um, uh, the couple of classes ahead of me and then in, in my class and in classes beneath me too, um, just as one particular example, there, there have been a number of divorces. Um, not like you go to seminary, you get a divorce, like a massive percentage or anything, but, but just enough, right? Just a handful uh, that really... Um, really surprised me. And when you think about the statistic, right, I mean, okay, you would just expect that there are going to be things like that that happen in a seminary community based on just national statistics. Uh, statistically, it's bound to happen. Um, but that's, that's been painful in a way just to, to watch people you're close to, people that are in community on the campus just kind of go through that. But I think that's just one, one strong, but um, just one example of of seminary communities are real. They're not distant. They're not this kind of elevated thing. It's a bunch of people with their frail lives trying to make it work and think about God um, in a residential community together, which is amazing and hard and beautiful. So you're preparing for a specific role uh, within the church that requires a lot of you as you help people recognize and enliven uh, and strengthen their own faith. And that requires a deep well of faith for each one of you so how do you how do you feed that? How do you feed your soul? What what are the practices that help you uh, keep that well filled? I can go first on this. Um, I uh, my wife and I were married actually using the wedding liturgy from the New Zealand Book of Common Prayer, um, and I think one of the beautiful things that um, their liturgy offers us is they have a wonderful night prayer um, that I love to pray through and love to center myself and helps me, I think, get in touch with the real, I think, roots of rest and being restored and reconciled with God and others. Um, so that's, I mean, that's one part of it. I think I'm also, being from Montana, I love to kind of be outdoors. Thankfully, my wife is also a gardener and loves to go backpacking, so it's not me just pulling my wife along in the woods. Um, she usually wants to be out there as well. So, yeah, I think those are both two things that I really enjoy as well. Um, hmm. uh, so we have um, lots of chapel services every day. There's morning prayer uh, at 7.45, 8.15 Eucharist with a sermon uh, in hymns. Uh, 5.15 evening prayer, and the 9 o'clock p.m. Compline. Um, you don't go to all of those. You go to one a day. Um, but for me, my practice at seminary has been um, to go to morning prayer every day as kind of my own um, chance for prayer in a smaller community. It's a smaller group. Um, and I did uh, the daily office regularly, personally, before I got to seminary. So that's been a kind of personal practice of mine. Uh, but then worshiping with the whole seminary community at 8.15. Um, but I think, I mean, seminary is just so funny, too, that you're just talking about and thinking about God in so many different ways all the time, and, that, and then there's also this, like, um, this nagging thought of, okay, you also need to set a, set a time real time for God, right? You know, the, the real time that you're going to be praying and contemplating and being the Christian that you're supposed to be, uh, that's separate from all this other stuff, and that's really hard for me, because it, it it makes the other stuff seem like it's not actually about God in a way, if that makes sense. Um, so part of my practice in seminary has been to, in some way, try to make the readings that I'm doing, um, reading through scripture for classes, uh, some sort of devotional practice in some sort of way, which is really hard. But 
Um, but that integrates it a bit more for me, and it, it doesn't give me that worrying sense that I need to carve away real time for God uh, apart from all the other stuff that we're doing. Um, yeah, I mean, I would echo all of that. I think spiritual direction is also a really big part of my um, personal faith practice. So meeting with a spiritual director once a month. Um, and she's really just like forced me to kind of look at my life, like every little minute detail and see that God is present in it. Um, so I think that's something since starting seminary, just there is no longer, I think for me there, it, it almost used to be like God exists on Sundays right? Or like certain times of the week. And then the rest of the time is like kind of set. There was almost more of a separation. And I think my formation here has just closed that gap a little bit. Like God is present in everything. Um, and we even have professors that will tell us like, before you start an assignment, pray, you know, before you start writing a paper, pray. I mean, I think that's just a great image of like, God is in literally everything we do, however trivial that may sound um, to say that. Yeah. I'm going to, I think I'm going to flip my question, although you could still answer the one I was going to ask, but I'm going to give you a different one so you can pick which one you want to do. I was going to ask if there was something, a practice or a tradition in the community life at VTS or some kind of insight that you imagine will now, you'll carry with you out into your own life and ministry. But I think you're kind of touching on that already. Yeah. So I want to go the other way. I'm wondering if being here at St. Paul's, if there are something about, whether it's our worship or our community life, our formation, is there, what is it that you, from this time here, perhaps you've been touched in a way that you'll be a different Christian or a different minister than you might have been if you hadn't been in this particular community? Yeah. I, you know, one of the things that I've done this year since being here is I've, I've had individual meetings, including with some of you in this room, um, just to talk about why you came to St. Paul's, kind of what your faith background is, what kind of work you've maybe done for the parish. Um, and one of the things that I heard over and over again of why people are still here, right, or why they come here is, and I'm going to flatter you too for a second, but just the fact that the clergy is so um, there for them, right, in terms of, like, pastoral care is up there in terms of priority, right? Um, and I think that's something I, I learned here. Like, we've got beautiful liturgy here. We're very intentional about that. We're intentional about our ministry. We're intentional about where we spend our resources. But above all, it's about meeting people where they're at and loving people for who they are. And that's just a sense that I get here so strongly um, from the clergy and from, you know, from all the, uh, the people that make up this place. Um, so I think that's something I'm going to take away for my future ministry of just, you know, you can try to make the service as smooth as possible. You can, you know, do all the right things, you know, and, and making things work, but it, it's about it's about loving people and meeting them where they are at the end of the day. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think I have really appreciated all of the outreach ministries that St. Paul's really has. Um, I'm a big fan of the wonderful um, Anglican priest Sam Wells, who talks about one of the highest goals that uh, ministry can have in the life of a Christian um, is being with, right? He says that being with is one of the most important aspects of the Christian walk. God is with us. And so much of the outreach ministries that we have here are not just about working for or us being on behalf of people, but actually partnering with people in community, actually strengthening those roots, not just saying, look how great we are at doing this thing for other people, but look at these great relationships that we can have, and also founding them through great relationships. I mean, you know, the oyster roast is fun for a reason. Um, you know, we get to have this fellowship that then supports 
doing justice and helping families and advocating in our community. Um, so it's, it's fellowship and outreach and worship all connected into one perfect reach out into our community and actually, you know, being that light in the world, which I think has been something that I'm really inspired by. I mean, it uses so many of the gifts that are here in our congregation. There are so many people who understand and bring with them talents to navigate some of these hard moments, especially when I got to work with people in Lazarus ministry over last summer, seeing just like the natural talents that people had in order to navigate some of these hard conditions that people are going through. Um, we're really, I think, seeing that you don't need to come up with a perfect ministry on your own. You have a community with you. I don't have to have all the bright ideas here. It's, it's being with y'all actually helps being with in our greater community as a church. Um, I have three very quick things, hopefully, uh, that immediately came to mind. Um, one is um, having in the, uh, one thing that practice I'm leaving with from St. Paul's is um, um, having the, having an opportunity for the staff to say morning prayer together every day. Um, the clergy all do it, some of the staff will go, some people uh, in the congregation go, but it, um, if you haven't been, check it out. Uh, it, it's a, it's just so clear that it's a way of grounding the day of work in prayer at the beginning. Um, and I just think that's incredibly simple and important. Um, uh, another thing is something in the liturgical customary, the document that all the liturgical people back there use for um, guiding our work. One of the past seminarians, Elizabeth Henry McKeever, also from Arkansas, uh, apparently, uh, supposedly wrote one of the lines on there that says, um, it's towards the top, resist the urge to be helpful. <laughs> Which is a funny line, because you would think that we all want to be helpful all the time, but I think the spirit of it is um, if um, you, like a seminarian, where if someone drops a fork in the cafeteria, everyone jumps to try and get the fork for someone. Everyone wants to be helpful. Um, but if you're, you, you do too much, you can step on someone else's opportunity to have a space in what's going on, right, of just being careful of your boundaries. So I think of that mantra all the time, resist the urge to be helpful. Um, and a third one is um, just the way in which we can um, collaborate with other people. Um, one of the practical things that we do as seminarians each week is we have lunch with Oren and Jenny at the seminary. We do group supervision rather than one-on-one, -on -one, um, and we have a little format that we do, a ritual of different things that we talk about. But um, I remember Oren telling me that the reason that we do that rather than one-on-one -on -one supervision is because that this is how parish ministry works for clergy especially, but also staff, where you're just always in conversation with other people Having, sharing ideas with other people, um, praying together, thinking through things together. Um, so I'll take that with me, for sure. I'd like to open the floor to questions, but before doing that, I'm just again reminded that uh, Eliza and Jackson and Thomas are part of a stream that has flowed through this parish for 200 years. Thomas is about ready to step out and move on, but we have uh, two others who are ready to step in. Karen Klein and Garth Winfield, our new senator. <laughs> Diocese of New York, and Karen is not only from my home diocese of West Virginia, but my home parish. <laughs> okay, questions for these folks? Cindy. Okay, I have a real practical.